Health Resource Center's webinar series. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. These webinars are hosted on the third Thursday of every month. So first, who are the Telehealth Resource Centers? Located throughout the country, there are 12 regionally focused telehealth resource centers. For instance, um, the South Central Telehealth Resource Center serves the region including Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee. There are also two nationally focused telehealth resource centers, the Center for Connected Health Policy and the Telehealth Technology Assessment Center. Each of the TRCs serves as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. If you're unsure who your TRC is, please visit telehealthresourcecenter.org and click the graphic, Who is your TRC, to find the contact information for your state. Also, I wanted to let you know that many of the telehealth resource centers are hosting regional conferences this year focused on building and enhancing your telehealth programs. Again, check with your local TRC for conference dates and locations in your area. Just a few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted. Please use the Q&A function in this window to ask questions, and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation today. Today's webinar is being recorded, and you will be able to access today's and past webinars on the National Consortium's Telehealth Resource Center YouTube channel. Today's webinar is hosted in part by the South Central Telehealth Resource Center. And so, let's get going. Let me start by introducing you to our presenter, Mr. Jason Goldwater, Senior Director at the Cedar Bridge Group. Uh, I first heard Jason speak at the Last Search Symposium in Philadelphia, where he delivered a stellar presentation about the National Quality Forums project to develop a telehealth measurement framework. Jason acted as the project director for the project, and he, along with many other stakeholders from across the country, developed a measurement framework that provides a foundation for the development of objective measures designed to assess the value of telehealth and its impact on clinical care. Today, Jason will present information on how the framework, framework was created and the way the framework can be effectively utilized and the next steps in developing robust quality measures to provide insight in the effect of telehealth on patient outcomes of care. How are you doing today, Jason? Wonderful. Thank you. Good. Great to be here. Good, good. I'm very glad that you're here. So with that, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing and let you take over. All right, can everybody see that? It looks great. Good. All right, so uh, thank you, Wendy, for that great uh, introduction. I'm happy to be here, always happy to be speaking to folks that are doing the work of telehealth. Uh, I have been involved in the field for uh, now almost eight years. I've been involved in the field of health IT for the past 23 years. Um, and I am, like all of you, incredibly passionate about telehealth and its ability uh, to provide services to those that would otherwise not receive care. Um, in particular, those that uh, suffer from particular conditions in which care is immediately needed uh, or where a lack of care can turn a uh, regular benign condition into something much more severe. So I appreciate all of the work that you're doing. It should be noted that this work, this particular project that I'll be speaking on was done when I was a senior director of the National Quality Forum. Um, as you have guessed, I am not at the National Quality Forum anymore. I'm now with Cedar Bridge Group. So today I want to talk about just a couple of things, a, a few things, and then I'll hopefully be able to open this up to some questions. 
Um, I want to talk about why measurement and telehealth is necessary. Why now? Uh, why are we starting to focus on developing metrics to evaluate telehealth? And certainly, uh, where do we think we're going to go from here? And then I'll talk about the NQF telehealth measurement framework, uh, how it was constructed, uh, its various components, and how the committee we formed to help guide us through this process uh, helped come up with this particular direction. And then finally, and what I think is also really important, is how you use quality measurement with the measurement of telehealth to move to a greater acceptance of the technology and overall greater utilization. As all of you know, telehealth is nothing new. It has been around for almost four decades. Um, the ways in which we can use telehealth with particular modalities has certainly expanded. And as a result, the amount of data that is available um, has also expanded. So with the passage of legislation, such as the now recently signed and finalized uh, Chronic Care Act, which really for the first time in over 17 years really expanded regulations to include more reimbursement for telehealth services, particularly in telestroke and in home dialysis care, um, there is greater opportunity for telehealth to be utilized across the country uh, both in urban areas and also in rural areas. Um, but why then, but in order to get to that point where it is widely used and is looked, uh, looked as as not simply an adjunct to in-person care, but just another means of care delivery, we really have to begin to understand how quality measurement uh, can be used to forge a pathway to acceptance. So I do want to talk about Cedar Bridge Group a little bit. I don't know how many of you have heard of my new organization. I'm very proud to be here. Um, it was founded in 2013 as Robinson & Associates. Um, it offers a full continuum of consulting and project support uh, for healthcare transformation from strategic planning, project implementation, supports complex data, prod data sharing projects, and solves persistent challenges through better use of health information technology, and we are incredibly dedicated uh, to telehealth, which is one of the reasons why I came aboard. And we also work with data coming from multiple health systems and care modalities to improve health outcomes. And we really do care about what we do, and we're very dedicated to our mission, and that's another reason why I'm very happy to be speaking to all of you. So where exactly do I want to begin? I think it's best to begin sort of right here. Um, and to really understand how medicine has changed, because in under, being able to understand that then gives you a better context of why measurement in areas that are not specifically clinical like telehealth are so necessary. So if you look to the uh, left, upper left of this particular picture, you'll see a record player. And when I've done this presentation before, I always joke that People that are under the age of 25 generally don't know what this is. Um, but all of you, I'm hoping on the uh, call today, have some understanding of what a record player is, even if you're just over the age of 25. Uh, but a record player really uh, was the first primary instrument, primary tool by which music was recorded and played. So you had a vinyl album, you would stick the album on the record player, you would either crank the handle or eventually you were just able to flip the switch you put the needle on a record and the music and a song would play. And it was great because you were able to hear music from artists that you really enjoyed and artists that you wanted to hear up more of. And if there was a particular song that you did not want to hear, you could just simply move the needle on to the next groove in the record and play a different song. So it was great in that it was re able to play recordings of artists that you liked. You were able to, to some extent, dictate what songs you wanted to listen to. But there were some disadvantages. Uh, record players were bulky and large, and at that time, relatively expensive. And records themselves uh, would fade or warp over time. And of course, for those of us that remember playing almost all of our music on record players, eventually you had to replace the needle because the needle would wear out and the sound quality would be terrible. Also, this wasn't exactly portable, so you couldn't just take a large record player into your car and play it, that would have looked incredibly odd. So then we moved on to the radio, and the radio was much more portable and at times a bit smaller, and the radio played selected songs from selected artists and would also at times play news and other forms of entertainment. So 
so the radio became aware of consuming particular songs and also became a way of being able to digest a variety of, of news and entertainment. It became simply the focal point of the entertainment nexus of a household. So before TVs and obviously eventually smartphones and other technologies basically took over, the radio was sort of the ubiquitous form of entertainment that was within a house. And music was played, and the radios were portable. They could be fit into cars as they were eventually. Um, they grew smaller in size, so it was possible to have more than one. But, of course, you didn't really have a lot of control over what was being played. Of course, you could call in and ask for requests. But most of the time, the program director of a particular radio station would be dictating what you'd be listening to and what the schedule was going to be. But it was a more varied form of music delivery than a record player would be. And then we flash forward to the oh-so-infamous 8-track player. Um, and the 8-track player was vastly different than both a record player and a radio, in that an 8-track player could be portable. It was something that fit into your car. And 8-tracks, for those of you that remember, were small plastic uh, types of cassettes in which you would put into the player, and it would play music. Sound quality was slightly better, and the best uh, uh, feature of an 8-track player is that if you didn't like a particular song, you could just press the button and it would skip over. So you're listening to, I don't know, let's say an ABBA, cassette, an ABBA 8-track. There's a particular ABBA song you don't like. I can't imagine what that would be, personally. And then you would skip over that ABBA song onto another one. And then another one if you didn't like that one. And that is exact, And that became a form of music consumption that a lot of people, for a time, found very palatable because it was portable cassettes were eight tracks were a bit cheaper uh, and the eight track player allowed a little bit more control over what kind of music you'd be listening to but the eight tracks were also somewhat unwieldy would damage very easily would warp in the heat and the sound quality deteriorated deteriorated over time relatively quickly so then we moved to the cassette player and cassettes were a much smaller version of eight tracks the sound quality was much higher and allowed the ability for you actually to record your own music. So you could hold up a cassette player to a radio and record particular songs that you were that you like. Or and there were some cassette players. I had one when I was much much younger, um, where you could put a cassette in and record songs from that cassette. And that led, of course, to the oh so infamous uh, mixtapes, as I like to joke, which lots and lots of women. Uh, when cassettes were very popular, used to get, and I often joke that I myself made probably two dozen of them, and none of them were uh, relatively successful whatsoever, except the last one, which the person who really liked that ended up being my wife. So I guess after 23 times, I finally got one correct. And then we move to the what we have now, which is the iPhone or the iPod, and that can fold up to, uh, at this point, anywhere between 30 to 50,000 songs, and that's just a staggering amount of music to think about, especially in a device that can fit into your pocket. Um, the, this type of technology is completely portable. The sound quality is better than anything that we've had to date. It can be played on multiple devices. It can be played uh, on your computer. It can be played on portable speakers through Bluetooth. It can be played um, directly through the smartphone through a pair of headphones. I even have an aromatherapy user that has a Bluetooth speaker. I mean, I could be, uh, you know, I don't have it on at the moment, obviously, but I could have uh, some steam aroma coming out and playing some jazz music at the same time. It's astonishing uh, of how far we've come from the record player until now. And medicine and data have changed in very much the same way. That medicine in the beginning, the amount of data elements that were collected were done through an in-person encounter, and they were, to some extent, relatively simplified. Um, there was the demographic data, there was the diagnosis, there was the treatment, and occasionally there were medications. We've now gotten to the point where that data has expanded tremendously, and the way of delivering care and gathering that data has also expanded. Uh, we can collect not just simply demographic data, diagnosis data, procedure data and medication, but labs and imaging and genomics and so forth. The amount of information we're able to collect on a patient, even social determinants of health, gives us a more holistic view of the patient 
and provides a way of understanding what types of care delivery would be effective. And as I've said, telehealth has been around long enough that it has expanded as medicine has expanded, that it became more than just video conferencing, it became the uh, way of doing store and forward and remote monitoring and mobile health. And it is continuing to expand. And so as that marketplace grows, as those modalities grow, the need for measurement becomes clear for two reasons. One is, is are these modalities providing effective care that is comparable to in-person care or provides care with a positive outcome where the alternate would be no care is being provided at all? And secondly, if you have a standard set of metrics that evaluate some of the benefits that telehealth could accrue, are you then able to sort of distinguish between different types of modalities to be, under, to be able to understand what modality would be the most effective. So let's start with what we consider the barriers to telehealth, and, and there are a lot. Now, granted, some of these are beginning to uh, be a little bit easier now. Um, you know, 15 years ago, the Medicare restrictions were pretty severe. Uh, credentialing was a major issue. Credentialing is still somewhat of an issue, but that's eased up somewhat. And with the passage of the Chronic Care Act, uh, again, as I already mentioned, some of the telehealth uh, requ rest restrictions have also eased a little. But some of those barriers have been regulatory. Um, they've been financial and financial in that there's an investment into telehealth technology. And there is lots of discussion about its cost effectiveness, its cost value, its cost benefit. Um, but is there a lot of hard data that shows that from a national perspective? Not really. There have been lots of individualized, randomized controlled trials and studies that show this, but on a national perspective, can we show cost effectiveness of telehealth? Now, law in particular conditions, from a national perspective, can we show cost benefit? That's still hard to come by. Um, there's accountability, um, which is, you know, when you engage in a telehealth modality and you're engaging with the provider and potentially with the care team, it's to make sure that everyone that is engaging in that counter, even encounter, even if mediated through technology is still accountable. And then there's this overall acceptance. And so Wendy will smile because she's heard me say this a, a thousand times. And I don't have the slide here, um, but I often say that, you know, one of the biggest barriers to almost everyone using telehealth is that there's still some thought process that telehealth is some uh, magical, mystical form of care delivery, when it is not. And I compare that to unicorns. You know, unicorns are people of, of favorite animal of, of people everywhere. Uh, my daughter and my wife love unicorns, but unicorns, of course, and I'm sorry to break this to some of you, are not real. Uh, they are fictional, fantastical animals um, that are the product of a very active imagination. And so, Somewhat, uh, the, the, somewhat, sometimes there's an equation between uh, um, Trump people trying to equal that sort of a telehealth with some sort of magical, mystical thing. And it's telehealth, not a unicorn. A telehealth is a form of care delivery. It's providing health care. It's providing health care at a distance. It's providing health care mediated through technology, but it is still health care. It is not a unicorn. It is not. Uh, fantastical elements of care delivery it is not a magical form of care improvement. It is simply telehealth. So why do we measure telehealth now? Uh, the reason to measure it, other than what I've stated, is to really understand its principles. You know, what are the foundations of what makes telehealth unique? What makes telehealth beneficial? What makes telehealth of great value to both patients and providers? Measuring informs the future use of telehealth. If you have a strong evidence base that you can look at from a statewide or a national perspective, that could inform what its future use would be. Measurement is an objective and independent way of assessment. You have measures so you can look at something independently, so you can determine what is the increase in access to care for people that have chronic, uh, chronic conditions. What is the uh, increase in timeliness for somebody to receive necessary mental health treatment. You basically create a measure that has no bias in it. It's basically looking at input to providing an output of a metric that objectively assesses what its benefits may be. And a framework that we worked on at NQF was a way of putting all of this together, to be able to provide a guide 
develop measures to accomplish this. The context where the framework was really across four areas. Encounters, which assume that telehealth encounters are just as effective as those in person. It ex for modalities, expected that the clinical outcomes for patients would be the same independent of the modality of care. So whether I'm providing care uh, through video conferencing or I'm using a store and forward device, the outcomes would be identical to those if I were seeing someone in person. Which existing clinical measures that are already out there, and there are 2,500 clinical measures currently, uh, assess or could be used to assess the overall quality of telehealth intervention? Was there a need to create new quality measures? Our committee did not think that there was, and they didn't even think the measures that we had even had to be altered. That you could still measure the same outcomes and the same processes with the way the measure was already structured because the data existed in the telehealth modalities to populate the measure appropriately. And then it was also to be future study. So you need an approach that takes into the numerous challenges. So measurement is never easy. Uh, creating objective measures is hard and sometimes a, a very trying experience. But you want to understand the expansion of telehealth, how the technology is expanding, how the data is expanding. And when you have a framework, you create concepts that expand and continue to build upon one another as the technology continues to unfold. So when we decided to start building this measure for framework, we had to take some basic principles. So what were the things we really wanted to focus measurement on? We, you know, you can measure all kinds of things. And again, with 2,500 clinical measures that are currently in existence, it measures uh, a large amount of clinical conditions. But when we talked about telehealth, there's lots of things we could discuss but we really wanted to be focused on some very specific principles. So we wanted to look at cost. How do the cost of telehealth compare to in-person care delivery? Does telehealth provide more timely access to appropriate health services? What is the experience of patients and clinicians with the services provided through telehealth? The overall experience, not just simply focusing on satisfaction, but focusing on the overall experience. And again, really to show that telehealth is, again, just another form of care delivery. And then overall health. How does telehealth affect patients' health and well-being compared to the alternatives, which is sometimes no care at all or care that does not come at the needed time uh, when requested? What were the purpose and objectives of the framework? Um, so one was to identification, facilitate the identification of the most appropriate way to ensure that clinical measures were applied to telehealth encounters to bring together a committee to help us form this framework. Um, and so that would be a multi-stakeholder review of existing and potential telehealth metrics. So the committee we had, which was just over 25 people, um, was a large list of people that run telehealth programs across the country, as well as those that have ex substantial experience in telehealth, um, either in managing federal or state programs and people that actually develop measures and also had experience in telehealth. Um, I can't say enough good things about our committee. Um, they were wonderful and they were experienced and they understood the need and urgency for this. And as a result of that, they were really able to help guide us through, this is what exists, this is what we need, this is how we can take existing clinical measures and use them in the telehealth field. Um, we also want to identify measurement gaps, what's not being measured, and then from that, create a framework which has a set of measure concepts and guides people towards the development of, clinic, of telehealth measures. So it does bring up an interesting question, which is what exactly is a measurement framework? I mean, I've been using that term a lot, so what is it? I mean, a framework uh, does not provide measures. Uh, in QF, when I was there, I can't develop measures, but that goes very much against uh, the mission of the organization and really would be a conflict of interest from a regulatory perspective because NQS function is to review measures that come in and work them through a very rigorous criteria to determine whether they get a seal of endorsement. And endorsement means the measure has a strong evidence base, it's valid, it's reliable, it's feasible it will produce a metric that will help advance quality. And a lot of the measures, clinical measures, that are used in national pro programs from CMS are in QF endorsed. 
So developing measures we can't, uh, NQF could not do, but NQF could develop measure concepts, which really are not measures themselves, but ideas for measures. So you start that by having a framework, a conceptual model. What are the high level areas that really need measurement? Then you start with domain, high level ideas and concepts like access to care, cost, effectiveness, experience. And then under that, smaller subdomain, smaller categorization. So access to care for patients, access to care for care team, access to care for family, and so on. And then finally, you come up with measure concepts, which are an idea for a measure with a description and a plan target. And then from that, developers or those that are running telehealth programs can look at this and say, here's how we can take this concept and develop it into a measure that would be helpful for our program, but also, most importantly, would be helpful to independently assess telehealth from a national perspective and provide data that is not available nationally to really understand its impact on access and cost and so forth. What methodology do we use? So step one, we did an environmental scan. Uh, we looked at 300 plus articles. Um, the telehealth literature, as we learned, goes all the way back to the 70s. Uh, we did not use that literature. We only focused on a 10 year period from 2006 to 2016. We felt that was the most relevant and would provide the most needed information that was up to date. We formed a committee, as I mentioned, that helped guide the process and the development of this framework. Uh, we identified appropriate clinical quality measures. We only looked at those that were NQF endorsed because we knew if they had passed the criteria, they were rigorous enough and valid enough to produce metrics that would be usable. And we only looked at measures that we felt we could align with telehealth where there would be no change in the measure, no alter alteration, and it would just focus on telehealth again as a means of care delivery. We reviewed MACRA as well uh, to understand what the changes in telehealth policy would be as a result of the law. We created measure concepts, or 68 overall that were developed. Uh, from that, the framework was created where we had domains, subdomains, and concepts. We sent out the document for uh, public comment. We got feedback from many, many folks. There were well over 180 comments that it was unusually high significantly high uh, for an NQF report. We addressed all those com comments and fine tune the framework of sentence. So within the framework itself, uh, what were our domains and subdomains? Uh, we had access to care, uh, and the subdomains for that were for patients, for the family, care team, as well as access to information. We looked at financial impact and cost to the patient, to the family, to the care team, to the health system, to the payer, as well as the society. We looked at experience, again, overall experience, not just satisfaction, uh, for the patient, for family, for the care team, or for the community. And then we looked at effectiveness, and we looked at effectiveness from four different ways, system effectiveness, clinical effectiveness, operational, and technical. And that was not aligned to a specific modality that covered every telehealth modality every way of conducting care at a distance. Now, from that, you can see that there's lots of possibility, uh, lots of things that could be done in order to create measure concepts. So one of the things the committee wanted to do is, instead of just trying to uh, I use an old analogy, to boil the ocean, it was really to sort of focus on what's really important. Because one of the issues with measurement overall is, you know, way back 20 some odd years ago when we were all wrapping our heads about how to do outcomes measurement and how to measure processes and how to measure structure. Uh, once we understood the process of creating those numerators and denominators and doing the exceptions, there was a flood of measures that were developed and measures that covered every, you know, uh, every possible clinical condition. There was large concentrations of measures in some areas and not enough measures in other areas. And that's sort of where we are at the moment, to the point where we have lots and lots of measures, we need to reduce the measures, and then we under need to understand where gaps in measurement exist. The committee, most of whom had been involved in measurement, really did not want to do that with this. Instead, of, rather than trying to take telehealth in its entirety and create measures 
that covered every conceivable aspect, they really wanted to focus on priority areas. And those priority areas for them were care coordination, uh, patient empowerment, the added value of telehealth services, actionable information, which was important. And what we mean by actionable information is the telehealth modality that's being used provides information that a physician uh, or a nurse practitioner or some other type of caregiver immediately knows what to do next that the information is accurate enough and comprehensive enough that they know what the next step is. The next one was timeliness, that it's providing timely care, that there's no unnecessary delays. And lastly, that it reduces travel costs. So rather than travel into uh, a health center that may be 100 miles away, which would be very difficult for lots of people that are living in rural areas of the country, telehealth to provide services almost immediately. And there was a great um, tweet uh, by my colleague, Judd Hollander, who was a co-chair uh, of our telehealth me measurement framework committee, wonderful person, uh, runs the Jefferson Health telehealth program, which covers not just simply Philadelphia, but all of its outlying suburbs and other parts of the state as well. And he was mentioning that flu, as we all know, is on the rise. Um, and there's a large number of people that were coming into the ER or the doctor's office for flu. Um, and they would be diagnosed and they would be said, you have the flu. Here's a prescription. Go get it filled. Take this medicine. Drink lots of fluids and take some time off. And what Judd was saying in his tweet is, we appreciate the business, but you could save yourself a lot of time and trouble if you would just click on Jeff L. You can have a video chat with one of our doctors. They can look at you. They can see the symptoms. Um, they would be able to determine what your vitals are because you'd be able to take your own temperature potentially. And then from that, then they could call in a prescription to a pharmacy that's near you. It would take far less time to do that. It would not require any travel on your part. And ultimately, the outcome would be the same. So he, what he was saying is that telehealth can provide those services, and it really underscored why the committee came up with these priority areas. When it came to clinical measurements, they looked at different measures by clinical area. So we looked at NQF uh, endorsed measures. We looked at the literature to see the conditions that were most prominently researched. And from those, we found measures in chronic disease, care coordination, uh, rehabilitation, mental and behavioral health. Um, and you can see we found 26 in chronic disease, 17 in care coordination, and so forth. We also found two that were in the dermatology area. And NQF endorsed measures are evidence-based, they're valid, they're feasible, and they're usable. And all of the measures that we identified could be used to assess objectively the outcome of telehealth services. It does become incredibly important to understand telehealth because while this measurement framework provides a great foundation and a guide for measure development, it's also very important that the framework be used to help guide acceptance. And the way we get to acceptance is having people understand the various uses of telehealth. It's not just simply me looking at someone if I were a doctor, which I am most certainly not. But if I were looking at a patient through a video screen, that is a form of telehealth. That is not it. Telehealth can be used for stroke. It can be used for ER. It can be used for mental health services. It can be used for rehab. It can be used for ICU. It is used in a variety of different ways. And again, it's not the magical form of healthcare delivery, it is healthcare delivery. So how then do we take the framework, uh, use that as a way of being able to write a standard objective way of evaluating telehealth services to move towards a pathway of acceptance? So I really think you start with these concepts. There is innovation, of course, because technology continues to evolve. And that's not going to stop. Telehealth modalities will get, will continue to be uh, enhanced. There'll be newer technologies. There will be newer Internet of Things devices. Uh, it will be very possible for you to take a lot of information about your current health situation in your own house. You have to use the metrics that are created through the framework that are assessing telehealth to show the utility of the technology to show not just simply how it benefits a provider, but also how it benefits a patient. It's also really important to understand usability. 
uh, because that's always been an aspect of technology that some people just simply are still not truly focused on, that they will build these great technologies, but realize that they're not overly usable. And it has to be incredibly usable to both the patient and provider so that the patient comprehends, understands, and uses it effectively. And there's not a burden on the provider to continually try to interpret the data that they're being given, that it provides data and it's immediately actionable upon. So it has to have ease of use and understanding. Then we have to be demonstrating through metrics its accuracy, just how accurate is it? Because if we're getting to the same outcomes through telehealth that we would through an in-person encounter, then you're basically removing any distinction between the two other than one is provided in person, one is provided at the distance. And then we move to accountability. When you have measures and you're able to assess telehealth across travel and timeliness and outcomes and actionable information and utility and care coordination and so forth, then you're making telehealth accountable. Then you're saying, if we're going to say it's going to help with the uh, accountability, you know, if it's really going to help uh, move telehealth for along, and we're really going to say that it's going to increase access, it provides more timely care, it's going to reduce costs, now you have a set of metrics that would really show you. So by developing measures from the concepts that are delineated in the framework, the focus will turn to what telehealth can provide, what its impact on quality will be, how it improves health for populations, how it reduces costs, or at the worst, keeps cost budget neutral, and what its limitations may be. You really look at measures that are patient-focused, focused on quality, look at modality, comprehensive, really build upon improvement and help drive results. So how do you intersect telehealth with measurement? You align policy initiatives. Um, so you support value-based initiatives, like many of the ones that are uh, in healthcare at the moment through the passage of macro or MIS. And you support those through telehealth by reducing misalignment. Again, you don't want to have a set of met clinical measures for telehealth and a set of measures for in-person encounter. You want one set of measures, realizing that the outcomes would be the same. You want to align measures, identify core measures for telehealth that benefit both patients and providers. And that's sort of the next step of this. We have a framework. Now it's really about developing core measures. What is our set of measures that go to those priority areas that the committee identified that can be used nationally? And by doing that, we sort of avoid the problems of the past where we did not have a core set of measures. There were all kinds of measures being developed. Start with a core set, let that be assessed, and then we start drawing some national data that could be used to affect even greater policy change. And then drive outcomes. Outcome metrics have little to no variation based on care modality. So how do we put this all together? The framework is comprehensive. It covers all aspects of telehealth with a focus on those priority areas. It's patient-focused. We really are looking uh, on almost every channel through the eyes of the patient. We have to look at access to care and cost and experience and so forth. A sustainable infrastructure, how you can leverage the different care modalities of telehealth to be successful. Equivalent success metrics. You're not differentiating between telehealth and in-person encounters. You're making them the same. By doing and moving towards a focus on core measures, you're getting the measures that matter. If the priority areas by the committee, again, were developed by people like yourself that are in the field every day. They understand what this can do. They understand what it has done. So they want to come up with a set of four measures that really get to the benefits of telehealth to understand what those benefits are, where the deficiencies may be, how to shore up any deficiencies are identified. It encourages greater innovation because if you have a set of core measures, as the innovation continues to flourish, as long as it meets these core measure sets, then it is a telehealth modality that will provide care that is equivalent to in-person care. It's streamlined because it's providing concepts to guide towards the development of measures, and it's flexible. A framework is not a static document. It is continually evolving, continually developing, so that as technology grows, as the laws continue to change to allow for greater telehealth coverage, as we begin to understand even more so than we do now what the benefits of telehealth will be, 
you continue to develop those measures. So for those of you that would like to download the report, it is on NQF's website, so I would encourage everyone that has not done so already uh, to please go and download the report and look at it. Um, I would, if you have any comments or questions, please send them to me at my now new Cedar Bridge account, and I'll be happy to uh, answer those as soon as possible. Um, I'm always required to give my Twitter address, um, so you're welcome to follow me. Um, and also, that is the Twitter address at Cedar Bridge. And for those of you that would like to learn more about Cedar Bridge and how we might be able to help you uh, in telehealth, and we would be delighted to do so and quite honored to be honest with you. Uh, we encourage everybody to go visit our website. So thank you all and very much. I've enjoyed this and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Wow, thank you, Jason. I loved it. It was very informative. Um, let's see if you have any questions, please enter those in the Q&A box. We've already had a couple of questions um, asking if the slides will be available and they will be available. Um, probably later this afternoon, maybe tomorrow, um, on the www.telehealthresourcecenter.org website. And again, the recording of the webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel. So um, we did have one question. Let me, um, so one question uh, suggested we not look at chronic conditions and behavioral health as separate categories, rather they are inextricably interconnected. Um, example, untreated behavioral conditions impede or prevent chronic medical condition recovery or improvement, hence significantly driving up total healthcare costs. And we just wanted to get your comments on that. So it's an excellent uh, comment and a great question, and I, I could not agree more. Um, here's the issue, however. Um, so. And this does not come from me. So I've had, as Wendy knows, the opportunity to um, deliver uh, talks on this framework uh, quite a bit over the last few months. And through that, I've also had the wonderful opportunity of talking to a lot of healthcare providers that are delivering services through uh, telehealth, whether they be nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, or physicians. And while there has generally been a lot of enthusiasm and general widespread acceptance of the framework, um, a couple of things that we've been asked, um, that I have been asked rather, is could we narrow the framework down a bit and create a smaller framework? And one of the ones many of us asked to do was on mental and behavioral health and to do that as a separate category. And so why did they ask that? There were a couple of reasons as to why. One, that they were telling me that they see more of those cases than anything else. Um, that there are more, particularly around children and adolescents, um, they're seeing more untreated mental health conditions in which telehealth provides a significant advantage. There are a lot of vendors that are out there that provide these types of services. And there are also some restrictions upon the types of reimbursements that are delivered for these services even though they are being provided um, almost disproportionately so to others in certain rural and urban communities. And as a result of that, um, they said there would be a great benefit to having a guide and some measure concepts around mental and behavioral health that really understood the impact of telehealth specifically on this area, not just in the areas that we mentioned, but also if, for example, um, there's been a lot of research that's been written about the effect of cognitive behavioral therapy on anxiety. If you're providing that through telehealth, what are the benefits that accrue from that? What are the benefits of telehealth in reducing substance abuse? What are the benefits of telehealth of reducing uh, some overuse of opioids that may be caused through mental and behavioral health conditions? So I think what, uh, what I was taking away from that was is well, I agree, they are very much linked, um, and we shouldn't necessarily look at them separately all of the time. I think in some cases, looking at them separately are fine for no other reason than it will drive greater policy change. Um, if, you know, the reimbursement rules are relaxing a little bit, but mental health is one of those issues that, that they have in debt. So if we're going to get them to try to increase reimbursement, 
uh, try to remove some of these originating site restrictions um, and really understand what those benefits of telehealth would be on mental and behavioral health. And we do have to separate them out. But I think that would be for a very designated purpose. Um, I think there's also measures we could do where they're linked together. Thank you, Jason. We have several more questions for you here today. <clears throat> One question, uh, what do you think the future of teletherapy, online behavioral health? Um, I think that's the biggest growing field uh, in telehealth at the moment. Um, I think that that's, again, not coming from me. That's coming from people that are practicing. And I think that is where we can show the greatest impact of telehealth. Um, I said this before, mental health is always an issue that those of us that are in healthcare talk about, but generally overall, we don't talk about it until something tragic happens. So now mental health is on everybody's mind because of the incredibly tragic uh, shooting that occurred in Florida yesterday. And it brings to bear again, why mental health services need to be widely accessible and why those interventions need to be done at, at early rather than later. And telehealth provides the way of doing that. Um, there have been numerous studies of showing the impact of telehealth on children and adolescents with eating disorders, depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, and so forth. And so if we're going to try to make a greater impact on mental health services, we have to be able to expand its access. And they're showing that telehealth is the, one of the best, most effective ways of doing that. But what we have to show is really it's understanding of what those impacts are and what those discriminators are uh, in order to really change policy and really to change people's minds. Very good. <clears throat> okay, we have a couple of people who are asking questions about, um, well, I'll just read this one. Are the core metrics described something that has taken hold nationally? In other words, are we working towards a nationally accepted core set of measures that fit the criteria of benefiting patients and providers? Excellent question. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, we are starting to work towards that. Um, so Cedar Bridge is in talk um, to hopefully begin a project um, that would take that framework, leverage a number of people that were on our committee and start to narrow down those concepts into uh, specific core measures that could be used. Since I'm not with NQF anymore, um, the sort of regulatory restraints of not being able to develop measures no longer applies to me. Um, so I would love to work with the committee um, and build out a set of measures, get public comment back on those, have those cover those priority areas, and be able to distribute those nationally to all of these resource centers, as well as practitioners, um, so that then we could start to develop a national evidence base um, of what the benefits of telehealth are. So the answer is yes. I can't get into any more specifics at this point, um, but I am saying we're actively working on this. Um, and then once I have some news that I can share, I will share it with all of you. Okay, great, thank you. Do you, um, do you think that outcomes measures are generally a logical progression from quality measures? I do. Um, I mean, I think that the big focus on quality measures is on patient outcomes. Um, you know, the way you, you measure, there's three different ways of measuring uh, quality of care. You can measure the structure, you know, does it support quality efforts, the process, does a provider or caregiver do X that leads to Y, um, or an outcome? If you do X, out, the outcome is this. Um, the emphasis of CMS, uh, and this was re-emphasized at their quality conference, uh, which was Monday through Wednesday of this week, is they want to focus almost exclusively on outcomes, constantly, um, and that they really want to examine outcomes from the patient's perspective as well as the providers. So I think the strongest argument for telehealth in terms of understanding its utility, its benefit, and its effectiveness is to look at the, the particular clinical outcomes. Now, if a provider looks, uses a modality to interact with the patient, 
um, and engages in, in a practice that is grounded in evidence, does it lead to a clinical outcome that would be identical to that if they saw them in person? In some cases, we'll probably have to use some process measures because those also would be uh, underscoring what the benefit and utility is. But I think what people really want to know in the telehealth space is, would the clinical outcomes be identical? Um, you know, there's lots of people that say, of course they would, but that's why you measure is to understand what would be, what wouldn't be, and those that are falling short, why, and what could be done to, again, correct those deficiencies. Okay, um, next question is, would you comment on the recommended effect sizes for every domain? They are rather new and may require an inferential calculation. Any comments would be welcome. I think that's hard to know at this point in time. Um, you're right, they're very um, broad. Um, and uh, you know what the weight of all of those would be, um, is sort of difficult. I think we would have a much better understanding of that when we're able to take the concepts and start to build them into actual measures. Then we'll have a better understanding of sort of portion and impact um, and uh, again, the types of data that could be collected, what that overall sample size would be and so forth. I think right now, you know, it's, it's conceptual. It was designed to be conceptual. So until we actually have specific measures, I think um, it, it's just, I, I would just be guessing right now that I don't want to do it. Okay, very good. <clears throat> do you have a few standard set of questions that hospitals or ambulatory clinics can add to existing patients' experience surveys that have been tested for how the questions are asked to get at patient experience? I'm not sure if I read that right. Uh, Hopefully no, you did. Yeah. And so, um, so yes, we we did some exploratory work on how the CAP survey, uh, which is pretty much the most widely used patient status, uh, experience survey, satisfaction survey, um, is used, and how telehealth could be incorporated into that. Um, but then there was sort of this other discussion of this should it be its own separate independent instrument. Um, and I, again, it, it, I'm not sure. I think I would want to see, you know, how we're going to measure experience of care um, from a patient and a provider perspective. And if we have measures that are aligning themselves with, with instruments like TAPS, then yeah, we should be incorporating those. And I, and I don't think there'd be a lot of resistance to that. Um, if we find that the measures themselves are really looking at something unique to telehealth, um, and we don't find an acceptable instrument to incorporate them into, then we might have to do something different. It's preferential to use what's already there. Um, creating an instrument to, to get a patient experience is a trying process, um, to say the least. So it would be great if we were able to sort of incorporate that into, you know, instruments that are already there and, and just be able to pull the data elements directly from those. Okay, um, question for you, Jason. Doing this work in this project, were there any great surprises to you um, that you discovered? You know, for instance, you mentioned there were 2,500 clinical measures already in place. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a surprising number for me. <laughs> so I'm just wondering <laughs> if, you, if you found, if there were any, are there any other great surprises that you guys uncovered? You know, I, I don't think that there were any um, major surprises. I think from my personal perspective, you know, so I've known Wendy for a while that there's a glut of measures. Um, and, and that, again, sort of comes from identifying the ability to create measures, not having, you know, a lot of parameters around priority areas and letting everyone just develop. And then, you know, choosing which ones you would be developing for endorsement. And, and it's never to say that development of measures is a bad thing. It's not. Um, certainly having more than not enough is always preferable. I think, you know, what sort of surprised me was, 
sort of what the priority areas were. I, I figured that travel and timeliness would be one because those fit into ACTA. Um, I was a bit, I, I was surprised about how much the committee really wanted to be focused on actionable information. And that came after some rather vigorous debate for a bit. Um, but that made a lot of sense to me that, you know, you're not looking for the modality to immediately solve the problem. You're looking at for the modality to provide you the data to understand what to do to help solve the problem. And I think that it's a really important aspect to understand. Um, because if you're able to really show that if you're using a mobile device and it's providing information, you know, the next step is to take this medication, run this test, uh, or go to the doctor immediately, you know, that's a, that's a value that you, you may not have already thought of. So uh, I was a bit surprised by that. Um, uh, you know, other than that, the passion of the people that were involved, the incredible dedication uh, to wanting to do this correctly, um, and really getting it right so that we can, again, be able to get a much better, broader national perspective of telehealth um, wasn't surprising. And in fact, uh, the energy level was so high um, that I really think that's what led to the success of the project. Very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. It was very informative. I always love to hear you present. You're a wonderful <laughs> presenter. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. I'll send a check tomorrow. Will you? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good Let good. me see if I can. Uh, um, I'm going to go back for just a minute. Try this again. My screen locked up. I apologize for that. So I, I wanted to mention, though, too, before I forget, if you are interested in um, research around um, connected health, then you may also be interested in the Society for Education and the Advancement for Research in Connected Health, also known as SEARCH. SEARCH is currently planning their third telehealth research symposium. It will be held in San Diego. October 25th and 26th. If you'd like more information or to be on that distribution list, you can certainly uh, send, an, send an email to researchconnectedhealth at gmail.com and we'll make sure you get on that list. The next webinar by the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is scheduled for March 15th and it will be presented by the Center for Connected Health Policy. The topic for the presentation is telehealth policy so far in 2018, and so it will be a great discussion. Registration and further information will be sent out to you very soon. As you can see on the screen, I have a link for a survey. Um, your opinion is very important to us, and so we ask that you take just a few minutes and complete this online survey. And before I disconnect, I want to make sure I thank Mr. Ray Dizon from the uh, National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers for providing our technical assistance today. And uh, I appreciate everybody for joining us and of course to our presenter, Jason. Thank you for joining us today. See you next time. Thank you all. <laughs>